America loves the game of chance, and passion for the game grows stronger every year, with about 35 million people visiting Las Vegas annually. But even before Las Vegas became the queen of all gambling cities, you could find a game in just about every town in America. My knowledge, every state had some gambling, illegal of some sort. I mean, I never would. If you wanted to gamble, whatever town you was in, there's always a game in town, somewhere. Gambling is reflective of the American entrepreneurial spirit. Taking a risk, sometimes you hit it rich, sometimes you don't. Still, it's all about taking that risk, that chance, and the stories of America's secret illegal casinos are as rich, colorful, and diverse as Americans themselves. My father and my uncle were in the gambling business in Detroit all the years I was growing up. The garage was always filled with gaming paraphernalia. When the, uh, the gambling joints that they had were closed for one reason or another, they'd move all the equipment into the garage and wait for better days and they could then spread again in another location. Throughout American history, illegal casinos were as common as the corner store in most American communities. You had to press the buzzer, you had little people, just like in the speakeasy days, and he could either let you in or not let you in. The gambling was fueled by an appetite for adventure, the capitalistic drive to make a fortune, and the constant need to sidestep the law. And in the event of a, of a raid, each corner of the floor had a huge cable on it, and they would crank the, the, crank the floor up into the ceiling, and all the games would go up with it, and all that was left underneath, because this, the bottom of the floor became the ceiling, when they opened up some card games, opened up some chairs, and everybody sat around playing gin rummy or pinochle while the police were breaking the doors down. You see these stores where you go into a barber shop, they got a pole there, it says barber shop. It's all blacked out, all you see is a guy's head sitting there, but he's, he's not looking out, he's on the side, he's looking that way for coppers or whoever. And whether a simple horse racing bookie joint or a plush casino, they survived thanks to kickbacks and cops who conveniently looked the other way. We had a chief of police in Newport named uh, Google who, when he, there was some trouble at one time, said he'd never seen any gambling in the uh, Newport area. And that was the exact truth, because he had never walked in one. He knew everything that was going on, and he was getting his money, but he never, ever came into one. Frank Biagene was the sheriff of Galveston. And he, whether he was paid off or not, no one really knows for sure, but he was brought into a a hearing and they had asked him why he had never raided the Balinese room and his reply was well the Balinese room is a private club and I'm not a member. I never never paid a policeman in Texas but I did in California, I did in Oregon and I did in Washington. Those places weren't legal but it didn't make too much difference in Louisiana. Listen, uh, Earl Long came down there at least once a month with, with his entourage with the lights flashing and sirens and you know and uh, on busy nights the highway patrol parked cars for us especially in the america of the 1920s and 30s it was a high stakes game attracting paid off politicians mobsters hollywood stars and those looking to be a part of the american dream detroit michigan there's a lot of horse books and in the county they would have nightclubs like they had uh, another Latin Quarter and uh, Bounds Club in Cleveland, Ohio Villa in Cleveland. They're real swank joints. They had big headliners and like Patty Page, Vic Damone. 